Hello and a big welcome today to, to all of you out there and also a big welcome to Luke Reinball. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to have you here. I'm so excited to hear about your horsemanship and everything. Oh, it's really good to be here. I appreciate the invite. We would like to hear a little about your life how how did you get where you are today uh, when did you start with horses and and all these things so uh growing up my my grandfather had this team of um very like large ponies small horse size uh ponies of marion and gelding and um my grandfather's getting older and he really wasn't riding or wasn't driving them anymore so i have an older brother and we uh just started going over to grandma and grandpa's house and just doing silly stuff, really no <laughs> guidance necessarily, but they were, they were calm horses. So uh, my grandfather ended up giving them to us and we took them to our house and we did every silly thing that you could imagine with horses. Things that I think if my mother knew we were doing, she probably, I hope she would have stopped probably. Um, but, it, but it was fun and, it, and we really enjoyed that. And at that time I was probably eight or nine years old, um, just goofing around the whole back 40 as, as it is. And, and then we, we shortly after that, um, that horse that I had, and again, my brother was older than I was, so, and slightly bigger. So he took, uh, the gelding whose name was Pat and we called him fat Pat. You could imagine why. <laughs> and, uh, the other one of the team was was Firestar. She was a mare, and she was aptly named that as well, um, with you know quite the opinion. And we uh, it was a, a, a frosty morning here, and alfalfa. There's some beautiful alfalfa fields, and the frost can little did I know at the time, but an alfalfa can if a horse eats too much can cause colic. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, when I was ten years old, that's what happened. She colicked really bad, and um, that mare had to get put down and I didn't ride. It devastated me. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't ride a horse again until I was 20 years old. And my brother kept, kept harassing me, I guess you would say to, to ride again. And so finally I relented just to basically make him be quiet probably. And realized how much I absolutely missed it. Right. And now again, there's no formal training. I've never taken a lesson to this point, but I decided I was going to uh, buy a horse that was uh, green broke uh, at, at best and started that that horse and um, had no idea what I was doing, really, but just rode and rode and rode and rode and on borrowed saddles and, and things and really started uh, me on a passion. And, and I'm a very, uh, I guess you'd say, analytical thinker. I will study something and work at it and try to figure it out and and that worked for me in ways however with some more help I could have avoided some of the pitfalls that I experienced such as um, I broke my back I've broken multiple bones oh. in my feet I've broken uh, I, I don't even I've lost track honestly and I don't say this to brag but but what that did is is it taught me that we need to find a better way Right. And those were the days of you got to tell the horse, your boss, you've got to you've got to make them know that you're in charge. Right. And, and all those ideas. And as I tried that, I realized what was what that created. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it just wasn't it just wasn't working. Um, but but we were, you know, at that age as a 20 something young man. Um, you heal quick. You <laughs> those things is just not. I guess, you know, you just don't, when you don't know there's a better way, that's just what you do, right? And I started getting more serious about horses um, from there. And and those were the days we were just getting into the days where the John Lyons and the Pat Pirellis and, I mean, this is early Clinton Anderson and Craig Cameron's and all those guys were starting to put stuff out there. And I tell you, if if there was if there was information out there, I was studying it. And we were uh, pouring ourselves into that. And I was trying different things. And some of it I loved and have adopted. 
and it's made it my own at this point. But and then some of it I absolutely didn't did not work for me, and I didn't like it at all. And you know we threw that in the trash, really. Um, but it's really created a, a a drive now that is starting to you know I I I like to think of it as a journey we're all on with our horsemanship and in that journey right you will always make mistakes mm -hmm. that's inevitable i think really i tell people all the time i think if you're not making mistakes with your horses you're not trying hard enough right and i don't mean mistakes as far as you know how you treat the horse necessarily but i mean in the methods and and the things that you're trying to do and how you're trying to connect with those horses mm -hmm. um and and by making mistakes right and and now we've we've learned that we don't have to ride the way we used to. We don't need to do those things that we're putting really the horses and myself in that, in that area where we were getting hurt. Right. It didn't need to be like that. So by, by trial and error, and I don't know, I've never documented it, but we're, you know, 20,000 hours plus mm -hmm. into this journey. And, and I was the kind of guy that if I ran into a, a situation with a horse and I just didn't have the answer, in some ways, I'd lie awake at night thinking about trying different things, right? Or, or maybe this will work. So then I tried the next day, and hopefully it did. Maybe it didn't. But what it taught me is, and when I'm teaching clinics and, and doing those things, <clears throat> so many times I hear people talk about the right way. I, I just want to do it the right way. And I think that's a very uh, misleading term, really, because... I always, I try to stop them and I say, let's, instead of saying it the right way, can we do it a better way? And that minor terminology change really, but it, it tells us our focus is just different. So, because really the answer to the right way with a horse is simply the way that's working. Yeah. Right. And a horse will, to me, the horse will always tell me if I'm on the right way or not, because the horse is getting better. We're, we're connecting, we're making that communication, or we're not, right? So, or they we're seeing some effects, but maybe it could be a little bit better. And that's and that's more the way I'm really just looking at everything now in a very um, just exploratory way, I guess, with, with horses. And, and I'm loving the results because of it. And I think the horses are too, you know, and, but, but coming back to uh, that story, and uh, it's, so I was in my lower twenties, and um, I met my my wife at a at a job at camp I worked at, which we took out on uh, trail rides um, all day. My wife was a lifeguard, and I was uh, the wrangler, right? As the term was. And uh, short time later, we'd gotten married, and and worked at that at that camp full time running the horse program there's 50 plus horses and we we did all that but they were downsizing that uh, that program and we uh were ready to start the next venture and at that point I went into business with my with my wife's father my my father-in-law and and started what I didn't really even know probably what I was getting into but the goal was to train horses full time and to um, really further what we were doing with that. And so we started built, we bought a, a piece of property, um, 80 acres that was basically just overgrown field. And there's a shell of a house, but it was certainly not finished. So we, uh, which also meant though, I needed to provide some income at the time. So at that point I started um, uh what was hoped to be a career in law enforcement that would only last a couple of years. That was the plan that we would work in that. Well, we got everything going here. Um, and then we would and resign from that and just do horses. And so after a couple of years of, you know, every day we would be working on the house and work say eight hours a day at that, and then work the, the real job, right? Quote unquote, real job at the, at the jail where I worked as a corrections officer. Um, for the for the sheriff's office and and that was and did would that was really starting to take off that career right but again i only hope to be there just a couple of years well fast forward a couple of years and on uh 
Christmas Eve, 2009, my father-in-law, who was my biggest life mentor at this point in business, in life, as as parenting, because um, we now had two two sons, um, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and you know that just those are that that word cancer is something that is right it's horrible nobody nobody should have to hear that but um and and the man just kept working and working and working cuz that's what that's what we're building right i didn't i didn't really have anything to my name at the time and and really relied on his on his guidance and his help in that well fast forward um into September that of 2010 so what 10 months later he unfortunately passed away from that cancer and we had at that point we had just started teaching clinics we were really catching some momentum with that um working with horses every day and and just just really at that point loving life right I mean we had as it goes our, the career was really doing well in law enforcement um I was training horses on the on the on the side as it is at at nights and, and weekends and that. And had just signed my first saddle deal, right, with with Circle Y saddles and 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 our and endorsements, right? It just started coming in. But that totally took the wind out of our sails. You know, we had two young sons and it really devastated us. And I'm thankful that I had horses to pour myself into mm-hmm. because that was the just the way that I could um I guess you'd say just talk, cry, right, on those horses and and just be just be real with those horses, right? And obviously they don't speak English that I don't know that they knew right, really what I was saying. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I needed that anyway. So it took us a couple years of grieving and you know, trying to be moms and dads and, and, and to those boys. And it went a, it went a couple of years and, you know, he would have, Jeff was his name, wouldn't have wanted us to feel sorry for ourselves and to, uh-huh. you know, just sit around and, and not keep going with the vision and, and the mission that we had started. So kind of stopped feeling sorry for myself and said, let's, let's get going. And we got back into the clinics and, building that business out to the point where now <clears throat> short time later I'm a supervisor in the sheriff's office I ran the tactical team I was an instructor I taught in the academies with the cadets and in service taught defensive tactics which is an interesting part because I learned so much from teaching defensive tactics and how humans respond to fear and danger that is helping me so much in what I'm doing now but I think I'll I'll get back to that here in a second, but um, I had, and as a career goes, everything going for me, but we're really, our passion was horses. Our passion was, was teaching people with horses. And it got to the point where my quote unquote job was getting in the way of where we were trying to go. So in 2017, we took the leap of faith and said, you know what? I think we just need to walk away from, from our law enforcement. And we went full-time, full-time training horses and full-time on the road with clinics and that. And, and honestly have never looked back. We were so glad that we did it. And, and it was a great um, example of sometimes you just got to jump, you know, and, and I use this illustration often. It's like with horses and in life, you can't, you can't go swimming and keep one foot on a dock at the same time. No. You just sometimes it's either you go swimming or stay on the dock. You can't mm. you can't do both. So we jumped in and 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 I guess figuratively got wet and have absolutely loving it. And you know, there's still obviously challenges. And as we're going now, we're we're on the road, say 30 weekends out of the year, and really cannot train horses in the same sense full time just because we're you know on the road more now but um horses have just been yeah they've just they mean the world to me they've given me so much we meet so many great people from horses um all over you know all over the place and and they have provided me a way to feed my family and 
a way to just de-stress from life. And I think the the videos that you had mentioned about um, riding bridalists and, and doing all those things, that's all just ways that I basically de-stress. And that's how I do that, you know? And courses have been amazing, not only getting through the death of my father-in-law, but I, you know, I had two coworkers commit suicide. Um, and, you know, that's just uh, the unexplainable things that, you know, it's just horrible. And, and, and what do you even say or, or think in those situations, you know, or, or certainly working with inmates every day as we, as we did. And, um, you know, when inmates try to commit suicide, that's just, a, you know, and I've had some people, they're like, well, they're just inmates. Yes, but they're people. Right. And that's just that when you see anybody to the point of life where they're so down, that that's their only answer. That just, to me, that does something to me. Right. And that just, it just makes you, it just makes me look at life different, mm -hmm. you know? So anyways, horses got me through that. And then um, this last year, let's uh let's see 2000 and yeah 22 i'm sorry but forgive me if get a little emotional but that's i guess just the way way i am so um my best buddy is my brother and last march of 2022 and he's younger than i am he was he was 37 or 36 pardon me was diagnosed with stage four for colorectal cancer, which is completely unexplainable, inexplicable that a that a young man that age would have that, but but you know, but he did. And we went through this all over again just this last year. And and on October 4th, he passed away. So, you know, horses have been again something that I can use to just get away and breathe. And, and to me, I, I almost can't ride too much in a day. And I'm very blessed in most cases that I do get to ride a horse every day and not just one, but you know, a few. And, and I'm, I never lose sight of that, of what God has given me with that, that not everyone has that opportunity. I'm so blessed in that. And so I, I guess in a lot of ways, I just look at life differently. And so many of the ways the horses have taught me that you know, the lessons of, of forgiveness, for example. Um, you know, I often say that a horse, a horse, two things. One, they'll never lie, right? Horses always tell you what they're thinking. They tell you where they're at. You know, whether we don't listen to that or not, that's a different story. But the horse isn't lying either way. Um, but the other thing is horses are so forgiving. Hmm. You know, and I, I often tell people horses have forgiven you for mistakes you haven't even made yet right and really when you think about that that's hard for humans to comprehend because that's not what humans do right yeah. we hold grudges we make things personal we we get mad we get upset but horses that's just not how they operate and to me that's so freeing so refreshing you know because again when you work in in corrections and that i just assume that if someone was talking to me they're lying because that's pretty much what happens right you're mm -hmm. just lying yeah and and the forgiveness aspect of of horses it's it's just an amazing thing you know it's so it's so beautiful it's so perfect and we could just strive to emulate that you know as humans to humans even you know how much better would the world be yeah you know? that's right yeah so um, at any rate, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, that's how, how kind of things started and got us to, to where we are right now. Um, and, and exciting to see where that might even be going. We're not even sure about that yet. So, <laughs> so you are doing uh, clinics in different places in weekends. Yes. And, yeah. Do you yeah. have anything at home or is it your private horses, your training or? So we do things at home as well, as far as we do host some clinics, uh, like we have one this weekend, um, which is 
It's a very interesting format, which is re- it's the first time we've done it. It's really taking off. Um, but it's our obstacles on one day, and we built a really great obstacle course with elevated bridges that you can ride over, you can ride under, right? And it's our big water pond. Um, we have okay. suspension bridges. We have teeter-totters. I mean, all that, just that fun stuff. So it's obstacles and how I approach that, which translates to out on trails, right? Any obstacles we might find on trails, water crossings, um, you know, logs, you're going over bridges, certainly depending on where you're riding. And and we work through all of that on, on the Saturday. And then on Sunday, we're, we're, working, uh, we're working cows, we're working cattle, which is uh, uh, so much fun. And it's a different to some folks, um, I'm not sure that in, in Europe and that if they do this, but would they do what's called team penning? And that's where there's a herd of cows and you have they're all numbered. You have to pick out the same. There's there's usually 30 cows in a group, right? And there are three cows that wear each zero through nine numbers. So let's say you go in with a team of three riders, you pick out three cows. Number three might be your numbers. So you got to get out all the threes and put them in a pen. But that's a way that's, it's a lot of fun. People like to do that, but we change it a little bit and we work cows more in the, in the, the way that is better for the cows. It's not nearly as fast. It's slower. Um, it's more methodical. So I always tell people, if you, if you push a cow too fast, two things happen. You make the rancher really mad and you fix fence. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to do either of those so we just slow it down. So we play some fun games, like we'll play tic-tac-toe with cows. So you divide divide everybody up into two teams, X's and O's. Right? And you cut a cow out of the herd. And we have, have used hydrated lime to make 12-foot squares, right? We're drawing out a tic-tac-toe board. And you have to get the cow to stop in one of those squares, right? either X's <laughs> and O's. And it's very tricky because if you put too much pressure on that cow, you push them past the board, right? Yeah. But not enough pressure and you can't get them on the square you need. So there's a lot of strategy because it's sometimes if that cow won't, won't cooperate, getting a square, even if it's not the one you want, <laughs> it's still better than getting no square, right? And and it's a lot of fun because like we'll split up, say husbands and wives and put them on opposite teams and hear the competition aspect of that going, but but at any rate, that if you get going too fast, right, you'll just just won't work. So it teaches stockmanship. It teaches people to just, in some ways, just slow down. Yeah. Slow down. It's better for the horse. It's better for the cows. And and people are loving that type of thing that we're we're doing with that. So we have people driving from eight, nine, ten hours away. Yeah. Come and <laughs> come and do that, and it's a lot of fun. So. Uh, we do we do clinics here, yes, um, but also on the road too. So yeah, and uh, it's fantastic to to make such a games to put a smile on the face on people sure. because it's today I think a, a lot of things is so serious everything. Right. So you just need to laugh and to Absolutely. get rid of all these heavy things. And and sure. it's good to do it with your horse. Absolutely, and and really, when we when my father and I, when Jeff and I had started this place, his vision for all of this was simply you could sum it up in one quote. He said, "I want to make this place a, a place where people can just get away from the world." Mm-hmm. And we have used that as basically our mission here um, to to just allow people to do that, and it's kind of fun because. Up here, we're up on, on top of a hill. You can't see any neighbors, which I don't know if you're familiar with New York State at all, which is where we are. It's kind of an unconventional uh, horse area, I guess. It really isn't a great horse area, but um, people think of New York and immediately think of the city. Yes. Right? Manhattan. But uh, mm-hmm. it's actually, there's 17 million wooded acres in the, in New York State. So it is certainly remote here, but yeah. So we we uh, people can come up here. You can't see any any buildings around other than our place. It's just rolling hills and and things. And it is a place where they can just unplug and get away. And which which is we have also started on that what we call ranch camp, which is a 
people bring their horses for four days and they do everything that we're normally doing with horses. We're riding the trails. We're working in the arena for body maneuverability and things, right? But we ride the obstacle course and they work cows there too. So we have people, um, we do this year, we're doing four of those events and people are just loving it. So, and my wife is an amazing cook. So she feeds everybody and people can just come. They don't have to worry about, you know, they don't have to worry about anything. So, so that's kind of fun. Yeah, and, and horse people have always things to talk about, so. No doubt, no <laughs> doubt there. Yeah, it's a connection, right? That's what yes. horses just provide that median, and, and it doesn't matter if you're riding an English tack or Western tack or driving horses or, or, or just brushing a horse. Hmm. There's just something about that that, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And um, I found you because i i saw a video with you you were were riding your horse without a bridle mm -hmm. and i have been with horses for over 50 years and i i was impressed because i i have never done that i have been riding bareback but always with a halter and and uh, i think that it must be difficult to not have anything but your your body so to speak yeah, it, you know, and it really is, but at the same time, and, and in a, two parts of that, one, when I started putting those videos out, you know, I've, I've caught a lot of flack from that, mm -hmm. from the, the traditionalist, I guess you would say, or maybe old school or whatever. Yeah. And never once when I did those videos, and many of the times I never mentioned it, I never talked about it, obviously people, in some cases I have, but, but people will just notice that. And you would, some of the people would just, they can't think abstractly, right? They can't think that, you know what, there is a chance that our relationships, human, dog, with horses, it really doesn't matter. It is possible to achieve a level of communication that is really beyond our comprehension. It is possible, right? Whether it's with our spouses or, or whatever, it can happen, but if we and oftentimes right the more you shout the less people listen mm -hmm. so many right a lot of teachers have figured this out you go into the classroom if you just stand there for a minute or maybe even whisper the best way to get people's attention mm -hmm. and and i i've kind of adopted that mindset with um with the horses of and it's important to remember that a horse is only as soft as that first touch and we as an industry, I think, are failing riders in the aspect of we're not teaching riders to ask for softness. We have turned horses into mechanical machines, basically. Of I kick you, go. I pull you, stop. Yeah. But we've totally missed the the idea of our seat and our energy, right? And and I often tell people I'm kind of you know being jovial with this, but I say your let's use our best asset, right? Which is our body weight, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that that idea of our butt, or that best asset should is really where this all starts. Right. But if we've always got in the mindset, I've just got to pull them, pull the slow down, pull the stop, pull the pull to do everything. You know, in in essence, when we pull on a horse, we distract them from what our body's doing mm -hmm. because they're fixated on on that pole on their face. And, and I, and I do want to be clear on that. I don't, I don't make this out like bits are bad, right? Because some people are like, well, you should, it, you have to have that for control. Right. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that you do or don't. What I'm saying though, with bits is people are turning the bits in there. They're getting lost in the noise of what bit should we use, right? Should we use a yeah. bitless bridle? Should we use a Bozelle? Should we use a Hackamore? Should we use mm -hmm. whatever? And to me, whatever method you're using, it that's not the point. The point is how are you applying your communication? How are you how are you working through that? Right. And 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 reins really to most people are a way to tell a horse something. I'm telling them this, telling them to slow down, I'm telling them to turn, I'm telling them. But I try to get people instead to use their reins. It should be a two-way communication tool. 
right? It's not just telling the horse something. What is the horse telling you back, right? So it it's often, it's the same, uh, I use this analogy, there's two ways in life to listen, right? One is what most of the world is doing right now, and that's not effective. And then the one changes changes the ball game, changes the world, really. But the first way to listen is listening to respond, right? Which is typically what people do in a debate, what society's doing. And that, and that way really doesn't work that well. But the other way which changes everything is we can listen to understand, mm -hmm. right? And when we listen to understand, now we have answers really right we're learning about where where humans or horses are are coming from so for instance if that horse is bracing to that rain why you know because of the hundreds of colts that i've started to ride it's interesting that not a single one of them was bracy when we started brace is something that's taught to horses it's taught by ineffective touch the riders have because in essence they're going to tell the horse everything but it's not but it's not something where we're really asking for softness and and in in a lot of ways that's accountability factor that the rider has to figure that out and that's hard it's hard to really learn about that touch and and at the same aspect we live in a very mechanized world right computer screens um, cars everything is basically a machine and it's all input based you just tell it to do something yeah. but but horses is a different that's a different world right it's, they're not mechanical they're not electronic so uh i think that I, i'm curious as if the if the human brain 100 or even 200 years ago if it was different than it is now of course we'll probably never fully know the answer to that but but it's at the same point if we want to connect with a horse we have to remember that that horse will only be as soft as our first touch and and that's that's something that if you take a regular lesson horse, right, which those horses are the salt of the earth kind of horse because they tolerate lots of pulling and kicking and mm. jerking on those reins. But if you try to get that horse to soften up, they've al almost been programmed to be self-defense, -def defending mm. in, in what they're doing. Mm. So with with a lot of riders, that's 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 a tough thing to teach because trying to show someone what softness is but yet they can't are not feeling it and at the same time cannot feel that then you know it's like describing something to to someone that can't see a beautiful ocean scene or something that that's tough right? that's mm -hmm. tough so um but it and it's interesting coming back to that with uh, the the self-defense things i was talking about and how the body reacts to that you know Fear is something that is real. We're all going to experience it in some way. Um, but the body's natural reaction to fear is to what I call turtling up. So in essence, we pull the arms in and we squeeze with our legs. Right? Okay. So when we pull our arms in, obviously, when we're holding on the reins, we're pulling on that horse. Mm -hmm. And and really, if you're scared enough, you're not feeling softness. You're thinking yeah. about surviving. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a whole different dynamic from that. And what I've learned is moving forward, once I stopped pulling on my horses, a couple things happened. One, they don't bolt anymore. Right? So say you're out on the trail and that horse gets spooked of something and they bolt. I mean, there's there's this whole video series and everything else that are trying to teach a horse not how to shut them down when they bolt mm. or when they're say they're going the buck. And that that's a whole separate uh conversation really but um or or even rearing these are all symptoms of a cause the cause is the horse is bracy and that's really happened because riders have just yanked and pulled on them and that horse mentally isn't soft and that's where the body softness really comes from it comes from a mental approach from the rider and the horse you can't have one without the other you can't have the you're not going to have a rider with a really soft mind that doesn't create that or, or really draw, I should say, draw that out of the horse. And at the same time, right, that's, uh, it's so necessary in, in, in everything we're doing. If we want to do things, say, going up to riding a horse with a bridle. And that's where, you know, I'll, I'll ride. Um, I have a couple horses I'll do this with 
one is mostly my my daughter's horse, so I haven't really shot videos on her, but um it's this idea where people are like, well, you've got to have a bit in that horse to have control. My my theory on that is the reality is just, if a horse really wanted to do something bad enough, you can't control it. No. You just physically can't. Putting a piece of metal in their mouth doesn't mean you have more control. Right? Because where that horse's mind goes, their feet go. Right. So if their mind is just totally like I'm I'm back at the bar and I can't take this anymore, that's where ultimately that's what's if they wanted it bad enough, that's what's gonna go. And you can pull and yank and pull on your face all you want, but that's just not where they're at. So it's the mentality aspect of that. That's where that starts. And then from that, you know, and people go, Well, they'll play this. Well, what if you run into a bear? What if you run into a mountain lion? What if you, what if you, what if you and they play that what if game? chasing that rabbit down a hole that they'll never catch right? because what if and and the reality is actually i did make a video of i, I ran into four bears all together a mom and three cubs um cubs from last year so they're getting pretty big i i ran into that with liberty um out riding and i didn't get closer than a couple hundred yards because well i have my had my goofy lab with me and he's a typical lab right he's not super he, he would just try to make friends or something who knows yeah. but, <laughs> but the reality is with that i mean she didn't react she knew they were there we've seen bears i mean there's there's plenty of bears here they're not grizzlies of course that's a different ball game they're the black mm -hmm. bears but everything to a horse to me is and i look at it this way everything is an opportunity to make my horse better mentally is where it starts but then physically Right. So if I use this as an opportunity to be a leader to that horse and and show them that, hey, no matter what happens, right, I want them to think that whatever we're running into, it's not a big thing. It's just the next thing. Hmm. Right? And if we build this out all on, on a foundation first and then just keep building on top of that, those horses will begin to trust in ways that most people can never even comprehend because really they haven't gotten out of their own heads of I'm so anxious. I'm so nervous. And what if really it's that that's, that's really what anxiety is, right? Yeah. It's fear of the unknown. It's what if, what if, and that's, that's something that also plagues the industry, which is that's just life, I guess, in a lot of ways. But to me, we have to, for me, it has to get to the point where I go, <clears throat> horse you're you're okay i've got you we have a plan it will work and once they really buy into that i, I love the idea of, there's there's really nothing you can't do with a horse once they buy into that idea that we are going to be the competent leader that they seek because horses are inherently horrible leaders right leadership is not an area that a horse wants to claim it out in a pasture and mm -hmm. in a, in a outside setting if you you know if you watch in in the horses I, I talked about all those those people in the you know late 90s early 2000s that were putting things out there i learned a lot from all of those folks but horses have been my best teacher i mean you watch a group of horses interact out in a pasture you can learn so much about softness mm -hmm. and communication with horses and and once you, once you get that concept and that idea in your mind and you see how that will work, you'll never go back, right? You just never will try to go to that idea where, you know, I mentioned it earlier when you have to, the old school, I got to tell them who's boss. Yeah. Got to tell them. And the reality is in life, if you have to tell people that you're in charge, if you have to tell them that you're funny, or if you tell have to tell them that you're good looking, probably none of those are actually true right? It's either known or it isn't. And that's, and that's with horses. If you have to tell them you're the boss, you clearly are not. Mm. Right. And it's that, it's that leadership idea. And, you know, we've all had bosses probably we worked for at times. Yes. <laughs> and good ones, maybe. And bad ones. And, and the good ones probably actually even think of them more as a leader versus a boss. Mm. Right. Usually, usually that's the case. So 
that's what I'm trying to replicate. That's what I'm trying to be with that horse, whether, you know, whether I only have this horse for an hour helping a, helping a client work through something or whether I'm privileged enough to have that horse in my barn forever. Either way, that's the same concept I'm trying to, to really model and, and, and show people, right? Show my kids as as they're in their journey with horses or or anyone else so i can imagine if if you once as you said once have felt it and and know how to do it you will never go back to the old system again right um and and so it would be easier for you as well to to form a horse to to help it to to the softness i can imagine Sure. Sure. And that's really all I want to do is just help that horse. Mm. Right? I just want to help him because, you know, there's so many of these horses that I see that I work with the, the quote, the trouble horses. Mm. Yeah, they are troubled and humans usually troubled them. Yes. That That's usually the case. So it's to me, I just have to try to figure out first off, you know, how, where are they at? What is missing in this link? And, you know, in some ways, I think that's where some people can get caught up in is is we we kind of go uh, almost to uh, trying to figure out all of the things back why they're there why they're there and and that is necessary to a point but at the same time do I think God put eyes in the front of our head to look forward right and and whatever had happened to him we can't undo that no right in essence that that traumatic experience we can't take that away. And I don't think there's a lot of point in trying. Instead, what I want to teach him is whatever happened to you, that happened, yes. And that's horrible. That's a, I wish you didn't. But where do we go now, right? And let me help you look at life now from a healthy perspective. And and once once you can do that, right, those, quote, trouble horses, not so troubled because they are so forgiving, Right. Like I like I talked about, they really will move on and things. People have problems with that more. But the horses don't so much. So that you know, I see this oftentimes though the quote in here in the in the US, they they have that term rescue horses. And these are horses that were were rescued from kill pens, rescued from, you know, abuse yeah. situations, whatever. Yeah. And what I see most of anything, uh generalizing here, but most of those horses are the there are exceptions, of course, so don't anybody get mad at me when I say this, but those horses tend to be the worst behaved horses. And a lot of reasons, I think, for that is because people feel so bad for what happened to them that they don't model leadership to them and show them the better way, the way that's really going to work for humans and the horses now, right? So because of that, they're so... um almost wishy-washy in what they're asking for those horses those horses can't meet a standard because the standard's always changing or maybe it's really very low at the same time so you know it, it's it's really it's like children if you if you really have a low expectation well don't expect much from that child right and and then i i use this analogy often in clinics i'll say when i was when i was growing up in high school if I knew passing grade was 65, don't even expect a 66 for me. I would only do a 65 because I had a lot of things to do that didn't include school. I really didn't care about that. Right? I want to be outside. I want to go do stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, if I knew passing grade was 100, I'd probably get pretty close to 100. Mm -hmm. But I was only going to meet the level of the expectation. And, and horses really are the same thing. Right. If we if we I always say, if you if you don't expect much from your horse, don't be surprised when you get it. Right. So it, it's a balance. Right. We can't be dictators. That won't work. We can't be overbearing. That won't work. Right. They'll give up. They'll quit on us because it was never enough. But So it's a balance. And, and really, I think that's the secret to life. Right? It's just balance. Yeah. Too much of anything, even if it's a good thing too much of it it's still mm -hmm. too much so those are yeah just kind of figuring that out in our in our journey same with parenting there's so many connections to parenting and horses we've got to have the expectations from from that from our children but 
the same time, if they're in kindergarten, we can't expect them to do trigonometry. No, and, them, and, yeah. and you can't tell them what to do either. They have their own mind. If they want to be a, a yeah. dealer instead of a carpenter or something like that, you, right. they, they go their own way. Sure. And, and that's the same with the horses. Yeah, and, and that's a great point with that is that horses are different, right? They mm -hmm. still have personalities. They still have um, different um, preferences and things. And and that's an important part of the equation too because they're not all going to be high-level jumpers no. or cow horses. Or, I mean, say, even take most any of these world champion anything, jumpers, dressage horses, cow horses, and then take them out on a trail ride. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> right? Good luck. Yeah. I mean, you you literally, that might be the way you die. Yeah. So it, it's all it's all an important part of the equation, right? And where they go, what what uh, unique fields they go in, does that, I mean, they do need to have a desire to do that mm. in, in some way, especially the higher level, right, competition you want to go in, the more they really need to have that, that inkling, that that drive that want to with that but uh, you know and that and then to go on to coming back to balance some of these horses that have such a high level of try will go and do all of those things now they may not be world champion in all of those but they'll try mm -hmm. and i think there's been a lot of humans that have really hurt in some ways a lot of really good horses because they just Took advantage of that horse's try mm -hmm. no so there, there's a point we do need to push them but they like you said they do need to explore that at the same time so yeah it's fascinating yeah. yeah we we learn a lot from them and and often i said the horse is your mirror so please treat them right and and uh, uh, absolutely you know and i and i say that when I was in my early 20s, when I talked about that, at that point in my life, I was a very impatient young man with anger problems, mm. right? And I learned very quickly that neither of those are going to help me out in life and certainly not with horses. And those horses will diagnose that, right? And it, it's a very interesting thing because I'll, I'll talk about this oftentimes. I'll say, if I can watch a horse and rider together, after a couple of minutes, I can really tell a lot about that rider. Are they anxious and nervous? Are they a confident mm. person? Are they looking for solutions or are they looking for excuses in life? Right. Yeah. Uh, so much about them. And, and I'll say that to some people and I've, I've had a couple of people almost get, get angry with that. And right, that's just a reflection of where they're at. They don't like where they're at. Oh. So, so when they're, when they're getting uh, really upset about that, that's just, that's that's pulling, drawing something out that they really already don't like about themselves, but they haven't done the work to change it. Mm -hmm. You know, so for instance, if you have a really confident rider that's that's just uh, always looking for solutions, so is their horse. They just adopt that level and that mentality. But if you watch somebody that's uh, riddled with anxiety, so is that horse. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I hear all the time where people the horse they might have bought a really nice horse great horse and after a week or two's time it's like well th this horse must have been drugged this horse yes, this is yes. the horse i bought <laughs> mm. and 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 we all know that horses people have drugged horses i'm not saying that but as a general mm. rule that rider made that horse anxious mm. and then it says should i sell him and get another one i'm like no 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 no, no. let's not do that to another one no no we've got to get the anxiety under control so that you learn how to manage that mm. before before really the relationship with your horse will ever get any better mm. and let's not do that to another horse no and uh, i know some people who who had changed horses all the time and uh, as you said it would be the same horse in a while so uh... right and that's the beautiful thing about horses even if they were with an anxious, they were confident before this person started riding that horse mm. and their anxiety made the horse very anxious. 
That horse is not ruined, right? They're never done. They'll all, they're always learning. Horses are always learning. You can bring them back to a confident level, hmm. right? But at the same time, let's, let's first get ourselves mentally right so that we don't put that horse in that because neither horse nor human want to be riddled with anxiety. No, nobody no. likes that. Right. No. It's a horrible thing. Yeah. Horrible. So there are ways to work through it. Right. And, and, and really that's what is a majority of my business now is helping riders. One of our, our most popular clinic option is a two day clinic. We call it confidence through horsemanship. And what that the whole premise of this is having the ability to uh, get that horse to understand that it'll be okay and you will help them through things. And then really a lot of that's created through lateral flexation, right? Lateral bend and in, in, in reminding those horses that there's a series of things that I do which teach those horses to really soften to the rein, to soften to our leg and soften to those cues. And once they learn that, which really doesn't take that long, you know, a day or two, that when a horse gets anxious and nervous, we can laterally bend them and then let them ride on a loose rein again. And it's teaching the horse to manage their emotions. But at the same time, what, if the rider starts getting nervous and anxious, we give the rider something to do, mm -hmm. right? Because really anxiety is fear of the unknown. Yes. When you break it all down. So if that rider is just not sure what's going to happen and they're starting, the anxiety is starting to spin, then we give the rider something to do. And because they've done it enough, right, that starts to take away the fear of the unknown mm. because they've already done this, right? And it, the horse goes, okay, yep, we're good. We're good. So if both of them can work together through this, the horse starts to see the rider as that leader, right? Or really the solution to the problem, right? And what's the problem? Who knows, right? It might be the scary bridge. It might be the, yeah. the plastic bag. It might be the banner. It might be the yappy dog. I mean, I, we don't know what it is. But if the rider can be that leader to that horse and the horse now sees that and knows that they're not on their own hmm. in everything, those horses start to trust the rider in huge ways, which eventually, right, is working to the point where we feel confident we can ride mm. those horses maybe without a bridle. Right? Because that's ultimately where I'm trying to go is I'm always trying to work my aides out of a job, right? I want to send my aides to the unemployment line, in essence, so that that horse, and, so, and, it's, and it's the 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 coolest thing that eventually if you ride this way, you start thinking about going somewhere yeah. and the horse starts to do it, mm -hmm. right? And it's such a fascinating thing and, and it boggles most people's mind. Like, how is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> that, it's because a horse is so amazing. That's and, and when you start riding that way, when you think about it, right? Say, I, I'm thinking I'm going to turn left. Mm. Well, our body starts to make a little bit of a shift. Yes. Very subtle, right? But the horse feels it. A horse can feel a fly land on their neck. Yeah. Why couldn't they feel a shift a little a couple pounds of body weight? Right. Mm -hmm. They certainly can. To them, that's a it's a whole lot more. And 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 if we if we start riding that way, I mean, the sky's the limit. It's so mm -hmm. so much fun, mm -hmm. right? But so many times we're so busy, uh, figuratively standing on a street corner shouting at everybody what we want. Yeah. <laughs> that no one's listening, right? If you go out on a city street corner and someone's shouting some weird banners or whatever else they have, most times we're not going to listen to what they have to say. No. It's, it's not the right approach. And and the, 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 that is good that they don't because I always used to say that when you're riding a horse and, and uh, you, you think that the horse is a little bit, it, it don't know where to go. Think about what your thoughts, where they are going. You sit on the horse. Sure. Oh, maybe I should pick the uh, sure. children up from school. What is the husband doing? What are we going to eat to breakfast tomorrow? Sure. And and everything is going around in the head. Sure. So the poor horses, huh? 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Just looking, because really the horse wants to do. Yeah. What 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 we're doing as a team, but most of the time the horses don't know what that is. And well, you're right because the riders don't know what that is. That's fine. Right. And and so many times, I mean, you think of this as say, uh, you know, we all want to ride our horse as much as possible, but carved an hour out of our busy schedules because life is busy life is crazy right mm. but so many times we work so hard at creating that hour of time that we can ride our horse we get them all saddled up and we get them out in the arena and then we go now what mm. <laughs> yeah not what <laughs> what am i what am i working on and yeah. and and that's you know that's a very real thing and then and then you mix in the cell phone rings and whatever else happens right and especially for moms i mean Kids are calling, a husband's calling, whatever mm. else. Like you said, you're thinking about what do we got to do for dinner and, yeah. and all these things. And that's real. That's life that happens, right? But at the same time, we've got to try to really just mentally be there mm. for that horse. And maybe that means leaving the cell phone in the tack room. Yeah, and that is the, good for ourselves no. as well. We, we need that space. The human mind wasn't designed to be plugged into electronics all no. day. Really wasn't. It's not healthy at all. So Yeah, that is fantastic. Where where can people find you if they wanted to get in contact? So we have our website, uh Luke Reinbold.com. That's R E I N B O L D. Um, also, our Facebook page, which is Luke Rambled Horsemanship, uh, we try to post fun things on there. Right, we have some of our a, a fun feature we call it "Between the Ears," where we're just shoot. <laughs> Speaking of cell phones, right after I just say that, but a lot of these videos <laughs> I just shoot from a cell phone, like yeah. just riding a horse, and it's right the the play on words of it's things I'm thinking about, but from the angle of between the horse's ears. So it's between both our ears, I guess you could say that's, that's coming from. Um, and those are really the best places, either our website or, or our, or our Facebook. Um, our email is Reinbold Horsemanship at Gmail. And uh, we do have some YouTube videos, um, instructional videos, uh, Luke Reinbold on, on YouTube. Um, more of those are coming. Um, yeah, we have some fun projects in the works with that too, so people can, can look for that as well. Very, very good. I'm I'm so impressed, and uh, I'm so happy that you came here today in your busy schedule. It has been a real big pleasure for me to meet you. Well, so. pleasure is mine as well. I appreciate the opportunity and the uh, and the uh, just giving that listening ear as you can tell it's something we're super passionate about and sometimes we get a little long-winded in it but hey yeah. if we can help some more horses <laughs> That's boy, right. it's worth it to me so yeah thank you very much and thank you all out there for seeing and listening today i hope you will subscribe to our channel here so thank you luke and Thank See you. you later next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.